Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 12, Beyond the War on Invasive Species. Dow Orion is the author of Beyond the War on Invasive Species, a permaculture approach to ecosystem restoration. Dow and I conversed on May 18, 2020. We talked about the difficulty of defining the term invasive, the dangers of the pesticides that are used against them, the question of whether they need to be eradicated at all, understanding invasives as symptoms of bigger problems, not as the problems themselves, pre-Columbian indigenous land management, intermediate disturbance as a restoration strategy, the notorious zebra mussel, the roles that invasive plays in their new environments, invasives as a stage in ecological succession, the usefulness of invasive plants for food, medicine, and crafts, how native wildlife takes advantage of invasive plants, how permaculture can be used in restoration and agriculture in relation to invasive species, and a recent experience I had dealing with an invasive species on the land where I'm living now. I think that a lot of people have heard the term invasive species, and most of them, of course, are assuming it's something bad, but when it comes right down to it, it's actually very difficult to define the term. And we could even say that there isn't actually one definition of that term. Yeah, that's something that I found really interesting as I was researching um, my book, because I was really trying to find out if there was a uh, kind of clear subjective description of what an invasive species is. And I found that even the National Invasive Species Council, which is in the U.S., the federal uh, government level uh, board that kind of looks at invasive species issues, spent years deliberating on the definition. <laughs> and even so, uh, they weren't able to come up with something that I felt was um, purely uh, an objective kind of uh, uh, description um, that, you know, could be... Uh, described in, in certain terms in one, in all contexts. So it seemed to vary uh, from place to place and time to time. Right. This is the agency that was formed uh, in the late 90s under, under Clinton. Yes, exactly. And uh, I've studied that a little bit, and Monsanto was one of the companies that was involved in setting that up. Yeah, and that's another kind of disturbing element about how at least the kind of big frenzy around invasive species and the purported damage that they do, um, you know, came to be so popular, you know, a lot of it was informed and funded by uh, pesticide, particularly herbicide interests, um, you know, so that to spurn the sale of products, uh, herbicide in particular, to deal with um, species invasions. I think that most people are probably not aware of the fact that the use of pesticides and herbicides in the United States has been rising over the last 20 years, uh, not falling. I think people hear about organic agriculture happening, that sort of thing, and they think, oh, we must be on the right path. But I think that due to, in part, the war on invasives and, and then also due, in part, to genetically modifying crops to be Roundup ready so that they can survive the use of pesticides, these two things seem to really have driven an increase in the use of pesticides over the last 20 years. Yeah, definitely. It's really alarming. And even for me, um, you know, as my background is in organic agriculture and learning about, you know, how to grow crops organically. So I was kind of immersed in that world. And even before writing this book, I was kind of under the impression that herbicides uh, were somewhat less toxic, you know, in the kind of realm of pesticide toxicity. I was always like, well, you know, insects are 
uh, you know, they move, they have nervous systems. And so we should be, I was just more kind of aligned with understanding how they are toxic. But then in researching uh, herbicides more uh, for invasive species management and, you know, the agriculture in general, as you mentioned, I learned a lot more about their uh, toxicity and kind of insidious toxicity uh, to insects and mammals and other life forms um, that I don't think gets talked about enough because I think people assume that they're a little bit more ecologically benign, but really they're not. <laughs> so I think that's important to bring to the conversation as well. Glyphosate is one of the uh, substances that you explore in some detail in your book, which I believe uh, your book came out before the uh, landmark cases in California, where a jury did find that Monsanto owed people money for harming them through the use of Roundup. So your book came out before that, but at the same time, there was still a lot of evidence out at that point already that these were harmful substances. Yeah, yeah, my book came out in 2015. And at the time, you know, there was still a lot of discussion, um, even on behalf of like the World Health Organization about whether or not glyphosate in particular could be classified as a carcinogen and a kind of a lot of back and forth around that they eventually did decide to put it in the probable category. Um, and then this lawsuit, or, you know, the series of lawsuits happened, um, which awarded people with occupational exposure. So, uh, you know, somebody who had been doing grounds management at a school, uh, ironically enough, um, developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is one of the cancers associated with glyphosate and particularly Roundup use. And um, yeah, I think that there's a lot more uh, going on with that particular chemical um, in terms of immune system disruption and mineral um, deficiencies in the human diet and also animal diets. So, um, you know, it's that's a big one. <laughs> And it's everywhere, as you mentioned. And it also reacts differently in water than in soil, I believe. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of the toxicity tests for pesticide regulation that are mandated by the EPA um, are pretty short in, uh, in their duration and also kind of, um, as you may imagine, <laughs> narrow in their scope. So they're not really looking at long-term um, degradation of products of these chemicals, like what they turn into once they are broken down by a molecule or two and how long that lasts in the soil, what kinds of toxicological effects that may have that linger on in the ecosystem for years. Um, and also, yeah, are they uh, transportable in water? Um, what's their ultimate fate? in an ecosystem. Those aren't things that are really um, looked at for the pesticide registration process. And then one thing you mentioned in your book that I hadn't really thought about very much before was that it's not only the active ingredient in a pesticide, so in Roundup, the active ingredient is glyphosate, but also the adjuvants, the things that they add to the active ingredient to help it stick to plants or to help make it soluble in water, etc. And that these are also substances that are not thoroughly tested either. Yeah, that was kind of a big um, realization for me as well, because we kind of talk about these two different terms, Roundup, right, as the trade name of the herbicide that uh, of which glyphosate is considered the active ingredient. And glyphosate is the ingredient that's tested for pesticide registration purposes, but that might be only half to, um, you know, maybe even like 10% of a mixture that's sold in a bottle. The rest of that solution is made up of other ingredients that help the herbicide stay on the plant if it rains or it's windy. Um, it also helps the herbicide active ingredient, so-called, um, penetrate the cells of the plant. And one of the ones that they, well, a lot of these are trade secrets, so they don't, they're not tested. And they also, the manufacturers don't have to say what is in there. Um, but one compound that has been kind of pulled out and studied by independent 
researchers is, um, I think it's called POEA. That's the acronym. And it, it actually has been shown to um, make, actually make glyphosate penetrate uh, human placental cells. So even if you come in contact with glyphosate itself, you wouldn't, that wouldn't necessarily happen. But if you come in contact with a Roundup, which contains this uh, adjuvant, the POEA, it can actually then allow the glyphosate to enter into the cell because that's what it is in there to do. It makes um, the chemical, you know, kind of uh, stick in or, you know, stick around for a while and enter into the, the cell membrane. Right. And the world of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides is full of, of uh, horrifying things like this. The more you study it, the more you're going to, to find them. And I guess I should just maybe bring us back to the the reason we've gotten into talking about uh, pesticides right off the bat like this is because pesticides, uh, herbicides are such a big part of getting rid of invasive species and Getting rid of invasive, spe invasive species is the goal uh, for so many people who are into restoration or into other activities where invasive plants are found. That is really where your book tries to turn things on its head and to question this concept of should we be trying to eradicate them? Yeah, I mean, I was shocked when I started working in the field of ecological restoration, coming from a background in organic agriculture, because, you know, I had heard of invasive species before. But when I got into this context where I was actually, you know, around people who did this professionally, it was just assumed that I was going to use herbicide and I would be totally fine with it. And that's just what everybody did. And the whole context was one of we have to get rid of these plants in this case um, at all costs. And if we did, then everything would be okay. <laughs> you know, that's just kind of the, the framework in which we're approaching ecosystem restoration. And to me, um, I was just kind of amazed because, you know, from a more holistic perspective, I could just see right off the bat that in every case where invasive species were thriving, there were other things going on in the ecosystem that uh, pesticides just weren't going to address. And, you know, it's the same in conventional agriculture. If you're having, quote unquote, pest pressure issues, the issue isn't the pest. The issue is the soil or the plant stress or, you know, drought stress. You know, there's all of these different things playing into the manifestation of um, pest pressure in, in an ecosystem. So, you know, taking that knowledge a few steps further to ecosystem restoration, I think is really uh, necessary. And, you know, these are a lot of people involved in these contexts are really highly trained ecologists. And I, you know, uh, it, it still is hard for me to kind of square that with the belief that herbicide pesticides are the only solution. Um, you know, these are often people who are shopping at organic food markets and only buy organic food and believe really strongly in that uh, framework for food production and yet are making decisions about uh, ecosystem restoration uh, outside of agricultural contexts that rely on um, pesticides. And I just think that that's that really needs to be questioned. And so, yeah, I, I've had some very interesting discussions over the years, and I feel like maybe the, the needle is starting to shift a little bit. Although, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes these, uh, these discussions just kind of uh, flare up online where people are still really quite defensive about their position and belief around this. So it's very interesting. Well, the, the, the discussion tends to infect any discussion that, that's around plants. I, I think uh, I've been using a couple of plant ID groups on Facebook 
uh, because I'm in a new area. And so I'm seeing things coming up and I'm like, oh, what is this? You know, and of course, if you're on a native plant group, that's definitely going to be someplace where that's very strong. You know, the native plants equals good, na non-native plants equals bad, just sort of black and white paradigm, you know, right there, which which brings us around to looking at the invasive plant, not as being a problem in and of itself, but as being a symptom of something else that's going on. You know, I think that that's such a huge part of the conversation that a lot of folks aren't really willing to easily engage in that, you know, the fact that our, the design of our livelihood systems has really degraded ecosystems to a point where native flora and fauna aren't thriving. And, you know, to really sit with that and um, acknowledge it and kind of uh, think about how we might approach things differently with that as kind of a, a basis of our understanding is challenging. Um, it's a lot easier, I think, to blame the messenger in a way. And also, I think, um, you know, we might talk about this more later, but one of the things that I think is really missing from the discussion of native plants is the fact that native ecosystems were and are still to some extent managed by indigenous people. And um, they they don't just exist in a vacuum, uh, free in, from people's influence. Uh, and the whole idea of like this pristine wilderness is very much a Western colonial uh, thought pattern that definitely needs to be disrupted. Because what you're referring to there in part is that when people are dis designating a plant as invasive or as non-native, there's a point in time that they're referring to. And that might be different from place to place. But I think, you know, generally accepted in the United States, it's like, oh, anything that was here before 1492 is native. Anything that showed up, up after 1492 is not native. And there are people, as you know, who are willing to describe most non-native plants as being invasive or who are willing to just throw them in that bin as soon as possible. And, and then the poisons come out. So this is really a, this is an important issue for that reason. So that date, 14, you know, 92 here is what it would be. But of course, you know, you said it's different here than other countries, how we think about that, because, well, what would that date be in, you know, the UK, for example, or Italy, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's, so it's all very subjective. I think in California, the date that they or the year that they work with, I think is 1742 or something. Um, <laughs> it's uh -huh. just like this random point in time. And, you know, it's, it's very, like, we don't really know the social, ecological, economic context that was going on at that point in time that led to a particular assemblage of plants. Um, you know, there's no doubt that the, the floral and faunal assemblies were different and but we should think really hard about why they've changed you know draining the wetlands of the sacramento and san joaquin valley in california has major ecological implications um damming the colorado river uh, for hydropower and irrigation capacity has major ecological implications and you know, these bigger scale things that we do, that we support, um, are going to change the surrounding ecosystem. And, um, you know, I think that if we can just kind of acknowledge that and observe what's happening because of uh, those major shifts, I think that we'll be in a better position to kind of understand these so-called invasions from a more holistic perspective. Because the entry of an invasive plant or animal into a landscape is, in virtually all cases, preceded by a human caused disturbance of some kind. You know, it's interesting, because I, in when I was writing it, I, you know, I was thinking, oh, should I like put forward the idea of like reclaiming a different name, because invasive species have has kind of this negative connotation but the more i looked into like evolutionary biology and some of the ways that uh, 
in the deep time perspective how systems have changed, it's through invasion is one of those processes and it's not unnatural. Um, and so I think taking that longer term perspective is important as well. Um, you know, that's how plants came to be on land. And, you know, there was like marine beds of marine algae just kind of hanging out in the shallow seas a couple billion years ago. And eventually, you know, the speciation happened because of changing conditions and the land was invaded by those plants. So, you know, you just see that change over time leading to uh, the type of biodiversity that we have now. I mean, punctuated by other kinds of events, of course, but that it's not something that is outside the realm of nature, which is kind of how um, invasive species are, are situated, I think, in a lot of discussions. Right, because plants have always been moving around. And so, for example, the emblematic species of the Mojave Desert is the creosote bush, Laria tridentata, also known as gobernadora. And that plant is actually originally from South America at a similar latitude and was apparently brought here when the seeds were brought on the tail feathers of migrating plovers. Oh, cool. Right. Yes. Yeah, that, and that's a tremendous distance that from the south of the southern part of South America to get all the way up here. I mean, that's a really big deal. So then in that case, what's making quote invasive species different is that people did the moving. But then it's not even just that people did the moving, it's that colonizing Europeans did the moving. Yeah, and I think, you know, just in my own kind of reflections on this, because I think the field of restoration, at least historically, has really negated uh, the whole indigenous management of um, North America and other countries. Um, you know, that the fact that people were here at the time of colonization, had thriving societies, had systems of land management uh, that were displaced forcefully in most cases, um, is something that doesn't really come into conversations about restoration. It's always about the plants. It's never about people's cultural relationships. And, um, you know, I'm in the native plant of Oregon group, and people are always posting these pretty pictures of camas, which is a very common um, plant in the lily family that grows here. It's beautiful. It's also a staple food crop of the native people of um, this part of Oregon. And, you know, that just doesn't really situate in those conversations. It's as though they kind of exist um, outside of that cultural context. And so I feel like a lot of these, this kind of idea of restoration is, is like this kind of guilt about what happened, but it's not really going to the appropriate place because it's not really um, doing the kind of deep healing and reparations work that needs to happen with indigenous communities who were forced off of their land and who's, you know, the quote native plants that we now say that we love are actually, you know, parts of a, a intact cultural management systems. And I think that um, that really needs to be part of, <laughs> the conversation of restoration and, um, you know, it, there's glimmers of it here and there, but, um, that's, that's a hard one. You know, I think for a lot of people that I've interacted with in the restoration community, because, you know, it's easy to just like wall off a piece of land and spray everything that you don't like. And, you know, for a moment in time, it looks really pretty. Um, but it's not really addressing these fundamental uh, structural issues, either culturally or ecologically. So it remains, uh, you know, just kind of a figment of the uh, colonial imagination, in my opinion. <laughs>
Right, because what you're referring to here as well is that the landscapes that Europeans found as they moved across the continent were not wild landscapes in the sense of being untended or unaffected by human beings, that most of the landscapes from the Atlantic to the Pacific were, in fact, deeply affected by the indigenous people who lived there, many different uh, nations and tribes, all with different um, styles of, of, of management that they were using and with different sets of plants, but all of it having in common that they were not untouched. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, bringing that piece of that, you know, human mediated disturbance or moderate intermediate disturbance um, into the discussion of ecosystem restoration is really important because. I think what a lot of people feel like is they're just, um, you know, they're kind of racing to put out the fires of invasion. And, you know, they just feel like every all this habitat is being lost and, you know, things are being plowed under and they're being paved over. And, you know, the intention there of saving and maintaining biodiversity is is good. However, you know, I don't feel like there's this kind of fundamental questioning of um, that very system that is doing those things. It's instead trying to kind of preserve these little squares of, of land. And, you know, oftentimes, like in the context that I worked in, I one of the first things I asked is, can we invite uh, members from the local tribal communities to advise on this project because here we are planting all of their like cultural food plants um you know i'm not i'm not the best person to be like talking about this um but the agency that i worked for was like oh no we we can't do that and you know i think that that uh really needs to to shift and i think that doing that would Um, you know, start to bring out a much more rich tapestry of what it means for people to really live in an ecosystem and observe, oh, well, if we burn this, you know, every two to three years, then this is how it affects this species. And we get, you know, this number of butterflies back per acre. And, you know, there could just be this uh, more interesting conversation of how people can relate to a place uh, in a good way. So, I'm excited about that. <laughs> oh, definitely me too. I have a very strong interest in wild tending. And that kind of connects to something you refer to as the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, because a lot of restoration, the goal seems to be, okay, let's, quote, fix this piece of land, and then let's leave it alone. We won't touch it, because that's the only way to heal it or whatever. But you bring up this idea of intermediate disturbance, which of course is what a lot of native people were doing. Yeah. And I think, you know, just in my, just observing what's kind of happening in the restoration community lately, I think that that is gaining more traction. I think I've heard the nature conservancy is starting to experiment more with prescribed fire in my region, at least. And, um, you know, seeing, how that does both in terms of reinvigorating native species and also, um, you know, I don't know that they're doing it particularly to manage invasives, but at least they're bringing that back to the land and kind of acknowledging that that is, in, at least here where I live in Western Oregon, um, how landscapes were managed for thousands of years. That in addition to uh, grazing animals, um, which, you know, many restoration uh, practitioners are not excited about that <laughs> proposition, but around here there were huge herds of elk and deer, you know, that were a staple food source and, um, you know, had a significant impact on the prairie and savanna uh, landscapes ecologically. So, you know, I think playing around with those different forms of disturbance and mimicking uh, fire where it's not appropriate, you know, in our current context and thinking about the timed impact of uh, grazing in appropriate ways um, is really another kind of important layer that we should be thinking about 
uh, for larger scale landscape management. So we've been talking mostly about plants so far, but I do want to bring in animals as well. And you talked um, at some length about the example of the zebra mussels in the Great Lakes, which I think a lot of people have heard of that situation and how big of a problem it's supposed to be. Yeah, I found that really fascinating because one of the things that I kind of started doing as I was researching, I was like, okay, I need to go for like the worst, quote unquote, worst species and really find out what's going on because I'd like to kind of um, prove myself wrong. <laughs> but the more that I kept looking, the more that I just saw that there were all of these other interconnections. And, you know, with the zebra mussels, it, it's just so abundantly clear that the ecosystem of the Great Lakes has been so uh, modified and uh, just through construction, uh, industrial development and pollution that um, something, you know, that thrives in the way that zebra mussels thrive and what they do, they filter water through their bodies and actually store uh, heavy metals in their tissues, which, you know, if you think about it over a long time frame, they're actually concentrating that. And as they die and decompose, they're putting that, uh, you know, lead, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, whatever else is floating around out there that's kind of effluent from all of these factories um, is being buried again in the sediment. And, um, you know, slowly but surely, uh, you know, it'll take several thousand years probably at the rate that they filter. But, you know, there's a tendency towards uh, cleaning that up and dealing with the conditions as life finds finds them, you know. Um, and I think that in a way, it's, it's something that should give us a little bit of pause, like we should be glad that there is something there um, doing what they are doing. Um, and take a pause to kind of learn from that and observe it and really be objective about the kind of effects that that's having, both on a small scale and a, a large scale. Right, because any any invasive species that's entering a new environment is going to be playing some kind of role in the ecosystem there. Yeah, and I think that that's something that, um, you know, often gets overlooked it nothing really exists in a, a vacuum um in a natural system there's there's always going to be some kind of relationship and even in cases um where it's apparent that you know things have kind of swung more in a direction of uh losing species losing diversity, like in the case of the, the cane toads in Australia, which is another species that I looked at, that was a, uh, they were introduced to Australia as a biological control um, agent, uh, with the hopes that they would eat a cane beetle that lived on sugar cane, which again is a imported agricultural uh, crop system that, you know, is not native to Australia which is important to contextualize, but um, the toads didn't end up eating the beetles. It was a different species of cane beetle that lived there, and they lived higher up on the plants than the toads could hop. Um, and these, the population of these toads really skyrocketed, and they're omnivorous, and so they ended up eating a lot of other uh, animals, native animals, uh, you know, there were definitely marked population declines of some as their populations expanded, largely because they have this um, alkaloid in their skin that's toxic. And so anything that tried to eat them, like a bird, uh, would actually die. And so, you know, it was kind of the makings of this perfect storm. There was actually a movie made called The Cane Toads that came out in the 80s. I don't know if you have ever come across it, but it's I kind heard of like about a, it. Mm -hmm. Kind of a cute, like horror movie, um, but one of the things that's interesting that just in the couple, I think it was maybe 2013, uh, researchers noticed that a native 
Australian skink, uh, a lizard type animal, uh, was eating small cane toads. And what they found, because, you know, obviously they had become tolerant to the, the alkaloid, um, what they found was that the skink, which was also omnivorous, had been feeding on another invasive plant or an invasive plant in Australia that contains a similar alkaloid to the one that's in the toad skin. And over generations of doing that, they were then able to start eating the cane toads. And so it's about 85 years or so post-invasion since the cane toads were introduced to where now they have a predator that has emerged. And, you know, on a, like a long time scale, you know, natural thinking about natural selection, 85 years is really not that long of a time. Um, they did definitely cause declines in the species of animals that they fed on because their population growth was unchecked for a long time. But they didn't drive anything to extinction that I'm aware of. And now there's a predator. Now their populations um, have, have started to decline also, you know, just due to other natural circumstances in which, you know, there's only, as a species, you can only kind of eat so much before you start to kind of reach the limits of your productivity from an ecological standpoint. You know, there's there are limits to growth, much as uh, we might not like to think about that in our current um, economic system. So um, I just found that really fascinating. And, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective, that there's, there's always that kind of interplay um, between species and there might come these kind of unexpected um, relationships that emerge, I mean, who would have thought that, that probably, probably, you know, would be hard to predict that something like that would happen, but it has in that case. And I'm sure there's other um, situations like that kind of emerging all the time. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L and now, back to our regularly scheduled... So there's definitely cases where, from the viewpoint of invasion biology, perhaps one of the problems they're having is is looking at too short of a timeline, not looking at a long enough timeline during which some of these things might play themselves out. Uh, you, you talk a lot about succession in your book, for example. Yeah, and you know, when it comes to, to plant species, most, if not all invasive species are early to maybe, some are mid-successional species, so they really exist in kind of this uh, ecological time frame that's pretty uh, immediately post disturbance. So, you know, in a traditional successional trajectory, you move from a disturbance like a landslide or a volcano. The first species to emerge are these early successional species that have rapid growth. You know, often they have lots of flowers with nectar or seeds for pollinators, birds. Um, sometimes they have thorns and other things to keep from being eaten um, so that they can survive and reproduce. But they, that type of early successional species exists, you know, in every ecosystem. And if you kind of take the, the label of invasive or native off of it and just look at it in terms of ecological uh, niche or, or function, you can kind of see where these species fit in in that kind of ecological time frame. And just imagine they're, you know, they're literally not going to be there forever. There's not going to be old growth, um, you know, Canada thistle or, um, you know, Dalmatian toad plaques or whatever these kind of apparently scary 
plants are. Uh, something else is going to come in and um, be the next phase of succession, moving it towards a more climax type plant community, which is usually characterized by, you know, older uh, or, or species that live for a long time uh, in, you know, forested ecosystems that you would see a closed canopy. So most, you know, of the ground is being shaded. Um, I, I heard a really interesting story from a woman that I met at a conference after I had written this, where she had bought a property in um, Northern California in the early 70s. She went, you know, wanted to start a farm. It was a 40 acre property and there was a 10 acre kind of portion in the back that she had never really had a chance to even visit. You know, she was so busy with the, the front 30. Um, and she said when she bought it, it had been just a, a neglected kind of overgrazed horse pasture. Uh, covered in Canada thistle, which is an invasive species. And, you know, she was kind of worried about it at the time, but she just kind of, you know, let it go. She couldn't really deal with it. Um, she said about 10 years in, uh, scotch broom, which is another invasive species, a shrub, a nitrogen-fixing shrub, uh, moved in. And eventually all the Canada thistle was gone. Uh, she did nothing. And the scotch room was just a complete thicket, like totally covered the ground. Um, you know, her local weed board, weed advisory council, where I was really worried about this uh, patch. She still didn't do anything. And she said, when I met her, I think it was in 2017, she said just in the past couple of years, so about 40 years from when she arrived, the scotch broom individuals are starting to die. So each shrub only lives about 30 years for that, that plant. And if the soil is undisturbed under them, they're not, their seeds aren't going to propagate. Um, it's one kind of feature of that type of species. But underneath the canopy, the soil was just dark and rich, uh, black, organic matter rich soil. And um, the seedlings of the native forest uh, in her area were just germinating in the shady canopy underneath uh, the dying scotch broom. So there was madrone and manzanita, Douglas fir, um, the gray pine, uh, just, you know, this kind of diverse array of seeds that were still in the seed bank. Um, and I just thought that that story was so beautiful and uh, poignant in a way because, you know, she just really just let it be in a way that a lot of restoration uh, professionals, as you said, aren't really willing to do because they're kind of working on this short time frame. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot of these plants are really just kind of filling a gap in in my estimation, um, to be move the ecosystem in, you know, another direction. So in instances where we're going in and, you know, spraying the wild mustard or, you know, or going in and, and, and you know, continually yanking everything up of a particular thing, we might actually in some instances be working against our own goals because what we're doing is freezing it there at that early successional stage and not allowing it to develop past it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of these species, if they thrive in disturbance, creating more disturbance will encourage them to thrive more. So disturbing the soil will continue to allow their populations to grow. And that's one of the arguments that I've heard people use for herbicide applications. So you kind of have to like look at it from that perspective too, in that they say, well, we'll, we just spray it so that we don't disturb the soil so that we can get in there, spray it down. And then, you know, we're not doing any soil disturbance that so we just give the native species a chance. Um, 
And I can see that perspective, but I would argue that, you know, there are other ways of accomplishing that goal that you can kind of not do soil disturbance and, um, or do it in such a way like with grazing animals, you know, that would come in and their the action of them doing it in an appropriate manner would actually stimulate the growth of the desired plants. Um, so there's lots of ways to be, I think, creative with approaching your, your management and, you know, depending what the long-term goals are, if you want it to be a savanna or an open grassland, your management plan is going to be different than if you want it to be a closed canopy conifer forest or, you know, uh, other types of ecological characteristics. So it really depends. And I, one of the things that I always kind of bring up to people is your goal shouldn't be remove invasive species. Your goal should be, you know, it should have a lot more to do with the vision of the ecosystem that you'd like to see. Like we're managing for something, um, for a forward thinking kind of vision rather than just focusing on removing what we see as wrong with the system. And that's a completely different type of relationship though, then we generally have with land in this culture. I mean, as you know, as a small scale organic farmer, you know, big ag is an entirely domineering and destructive practice. Yeah. And I, you know, it's like so amazing to me. That's one of the things when I do presentations about this, I kind of bring up again and again, but you know, most every year for the past 20 years, at least there's about 250 million acres of crops grown in the um, United States that are just three crops, corn, soy, and wheat. And 250 million acres is much more land than um, any invasive species or even all invasive species. If you were to total up the amount of acres that, um, invasive species cover, it wouldn't even touch that amount of land. And yet, you know, we consider in kind of our collective imagination about land management and economics, we consider that corn and soy and wheat to be valuable. And we consider the destruction of ecosystems in their name to be something that we have to do. And, um, you know, I really think that that needs to be questioned. I think restoration professionals should be really thinking about those landscapes as ones that need to be addressed because that's where we're getting the dead zone, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that's where these made, it's a major driver of biodiversity loss worldwide. Um, so let's, let's put our, our hearts and our minds towards um, addressing the real root of the problem and get creative with uh, agricultural restoration and forestry restoration. And, you know, we should be meeting all of these biodiversity goals in the context in which our, we're meeting our, our livelihood needs. Um, and that's where we really need to focus. Totally. And now you also talked about how there's different um, species of invasive plants that we can use as well. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because many of them um, have some kind of uh, either edible or medicinal or craft uh, value, if you want to you know, put a value to it, but they have like a, an opportunity, I think, um, you know, to engage with them in a way that maybe uh, we don't think of as often, um, you know, many beekeepers are aware of some of the values that, that invasive species offer in terms of um, long lasting blooms like star thistle and Himalayan blackberries are prized um, by many beekeepers in the Western United States. Um, and, you know, many of them can be eaten directly as food for people like uh, garlic mustard, um, even kudzu root is edible. Um, there's lots of them that have different uses. And 
for those that aren't directly edible, many of them create a lot of really valuable biomass. So, you know, thinking about compost and a compost building on a larger scale, which helps with soil remediation, organic matter building, carbon sequestration. You know, there's lots of different things that we could be um, thinking about. Um, you know, as a person that's interested in food production, and, you know, I, I've done a lot of different <laughs> things over the years in terms of, like, growing food for sale or growing food for myself. And so I, I often think about things in relationship to that and, and to just meeting my needs and my community's needs and um, thinking about kind of melding our larger landscape management towards to meeting some of those needs, I think is um, really important as well. Right, because everyone loves blackberries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they complain about about the the shrubs, and it's like, well, but where do you think the blackberries come from? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, and they're really valuable habitat. You know, it's like when you drive. At least I'm in the southern Willamette Valley in Oregon, and you know, driving up the valley um, where it's a big ag territory. I mean, the whole thing is completely decimated. Again, it's like. What are we? What are we seeing? Are we mad at some shrub, or are we? Should we be mad at you know these riparian areas that are completely destroyed and the oak savanna that's completely plowed under? Um, you know, blackberries are great in that context. <laughs> you know, they're providing some valuable ecosystem services. Yeah, I spent some time farming in the in the Willamette Valley myself in um, Polk County near um, Monmouth right in the heart of grass seed country there, you know, and that's so many nasty chemicals and so many bad practices that they use for that crop, which takes up fully 50% of the Willamette Valley and which is not edible. It's just an ornamental. It's literally growing seed for golf courses and lawns. That's half the valley right there. And so that's the problem, you know, in the Willamette Valley is the fact that you drained or otherwise affected well over 90% of the wetlands in that area. And then replaced it with these exotic crops, most of which aren't even for food because people are like, oh, farming, we need that. We need to eat. Well, yeah, but uh, how much of the corn is <laughs> being grown for ethanol? How much of the corn is being grown for um for the large confined animal operations right which which people oppose for any number of reasons you know and you know that that's a tremendous amount of land and that's all having poison dumped on it etc cetera, etc cetera. not not for food you know and of course all agricultural species are excluded from the definition of invasive for anybody that's from the middle states of the united states you know knows it's just the the whole landscape is corn and soy. It's just, you know, it's appalling to me. It's very sad that that's what we've done uh, to that landscape. And, you know, I, I, there, I know that a lot of people are working to change that and to, you know, reimagine, like, you know, get the animals out of the buildings where they're eating that corn and soy and put them onto perennial prairies where they want to be. They want to be outside and, you know, we could have so many ecosystem services by restoring that landscape to, you know, not necessarily what exactly it was before, but at least an approximation of it. And everybody would be happier. The food would be much healthier. The animal products would be much healthier. The animals would be healthier and happier than we would, too. I think that the idea of bringing a lot of the buffalo back is a really beautiful vision as well, because they had an amazing relationship with the plants there and with succession and with molding the landscape. And of course, the range of the buffalo was itself expanded by the burning and prairie upkeep of a lot of the Native Americans who lived there before. Yeah, I mean, the extent to which people were modifying grasslands to, to create the forage for ruminants is pretty extensive in the temperate world. And, you know, I think that there's a lot that we can 
learn from that and adapt to our current um, situation. And, you know, there's some really interesting research coming out about uh, the carbon sequestration capacity of those systems, which, you know, need to be looked at in close comparison with the corn soy monoculture, which relies on tilling, you know, which releases CO2. And um, I think that, you know, to me, my focus, and I wish that more folks interested in restoration and native plants and all of this would really be turning their attention to addressing some of these fundamental drivers of ecosystem loss and habitat loss that go on year after year after year and um, really kind of think about how, you know, when we go to the store, we're, we're literally like, making that happen and um, we need to be actively participating in revisioning that um, system and and you know where I live I live in kind of industrial forest land um, and it's the same here I think that reimagining how we relate to forests and timber production and um, you know e the ecological, functionality of an intact forest versus a monoculture um, is just is fundamental to reimagining the economy that could take place here um, you know because there's so much pride in like the historic uh, timber economy and you know the idea that it's it's been uh, downgraded because of environmental concerns is just you know, it really needs to be questioned, but in a way that brings forward this alternative uh, view and pra series of practices that could invigorate everything. That's what gets me excited. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. And I mean, certainly the, the, the problems with the, the decline of the timber industry in Oregon is, is due largely to the fact that you cut 90% of the trees, of the old growth trees down. I, I remember speaking to one forest activist from there, from the area who said, well, one thing we need to do is stop thinking of Oregon as being a timber resource state. She said, it's just not anymore. We need to think about it in different ways. And I know in your book, you are talking about uh, much smaller scale operations, uh, using different kinds of trees, using forests that are mixed for uh, handicrafts and stuff like that. So not the industrial scale that it, that it currently is, you know, because obviously I think that's that's been kind of lurking in the background of our whole conversation here is just been the industrialized approach to anything isn't working. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as, you know, I've really been kind of like sitting with this for a while, like, how did this happen exactly? Like, how did we get into this situation where so many people's livelihoods are not directly tied to their home ecosystems anymore? And, um, you know, how do we reasonably kind of make those kinds of connections important again and economically viable in our current context. You know, I, I don't, I'm not like such a utopian that I just think, Oh, well, we can just like go and you know, not have to make money and just have like berries falling from tree, you know, shrubs uh -huh. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, that would be nice. But, you know, I realize that we are where we are. And I, so I think that really linking up, the, the real economic outcomes and kind of trying to come up with models that meet people's needs in the context of um, revitalizing ecologies uh, is really a, an interesting series of conversations and, and edges, you know, for the next several decades. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, you've you've been out to the Oregon coast and seen the piles of logs that they're just going to be shipping overseas, for example. That that doesn't work. That's not about relocalizing an economy to be sending all of the all of the trees, you know, across the ocean. No, and and even just the idea of this kind of rampant ongoing development and, you know, what are those trees being used for like what what's that lumber building and you know it just it's kind of this 
big uh, cycle, you know, and I think that we're in the, the context that we are now with the COVID situation where hopefully we have this opportunity to kind of take a little bit more inventory of what lies closer to home and, um, you know, sit with some of these factors and think about what kinds of relationships are, are really valuable um, when we do take a pause from consumption and, um, you know, at least to some extent, uh, really look at some of the, the fundamental things that are important in our lives. So in your book, the last part of it, you're talking about how to apply the principles of permaculture to the situation of invasive invasive species. And that seems like that's that's kind of what we've been talking up to the last couple minutes here. For me, the, the kind of um, ethics and principles of permaculture, you know, which are really based on, I would say, like a, a global survey of traditional land-based indigenous techniques and technologies from all over the world. Um, you know, they have these kind of fundamental patterns which are expressed in the, in the principles. And I think that, you know, using that framework for me has been really helpful in just kind of thinking about challenges and, you know, the kind of issues that invasive species management brings up um, for people. And so, you know, one of those is the, the problem is the solution. Like you always kind of look towards how you could kind of think about the situation creatively and have like a, a perspective on it that, you know, we can kind of come up with something that works for people and also for the non-human world because you know that's one of the things that we say in, in in permaculture is Gaia or like the earth is the ultimate client like what we're really working for is not just human needs but um really meeting the the needs and, and enlivening um the non-human world making space for that and you know that's something that as we've talked about, this isn't really considered in a lot of conventional uh, contexts. Although that was certainly a, a, a bigger understanding like that was certainly central to a lot of the Native American approaches that were here before. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, that, that kind of whole systems perspective and, and understanding that our actions have ramifications that ripple throughout um, the ecosystem where we live is really something that um, pre-capitalism and even like inter-capitalism, people fundamentally understand that. And I think that, um, you know, we've been kind of blinded as a collective for the past few hundred years by, you know, not our own volition, but just kind of... Um, what's been imposed in the interest of making money. And um, I think we really need to kind of uh, take some time to step back from that and, and think about what that's yielded for our, ourselves and for our planet and, um, you know, re-envision what, what could be instead. And learning from, you know, people who have had that deep relationship with, landscapes for thousands of years and who have not, you know, been displaced. I would say, you know, just as uh, in my own research, I've been looking more into what, uh, as a person of European descent, like what the history of uh, people was there. And, um, you know, it follows a similar kind of pattern. The enclosures of the commons in England and France and Scotland, Ireland, uh, you know, these uh, places where people used to make a non-monetary based livelihood work um, was kind of the nascent 
uh, beginnings of capitalism that edged out into colonialism once the resources were kind of stretched in Europe. It, you know, the powerful class went looking for more. And so, you know, that kind of trauma of experiencing land dispossession um, has been going on for a very long time. And I think that that's an interesting story to tell as well. Because partly what we're accusing invasives of doing is dispossessing. Yeah, and I think that goes back to that kind of guilt feeling. Like, we know that something's wrong out in the ecosystem, and it's it, it can be easy to just be like, oh, well, that it's the plant. It's the plant that is displacing all of these beautiful natives that should be here instead. When, you know, kind of the subtext of that is, European interests dispossessed, you know, people who have a rightful claim to this land. Um, and maybe we feel a little bit guilty about that, as, as we should. I mean, as people who have benefited from that dispossession, uh, we really need to reckon with that and what that means and continues to, to mean for our indigenous communities. So, um, it's a very rich conversation, I would say. Is there anything that, because your book came out like five years ago now, is there anything that you would you know, add at this point? Do you ever think, oh boy, now I'd add another chapter, or I wish I could throw in this story now. Is there anything you've learned like that? Yeah, I haven't really thought of, about that in particular, but I'd like to kind of add in some of the conversations that I've had with these folks working in the field of restoration who have reached out to me either directly or just kind of messaging me and saying like, thank you for writing this. This is, you know, something that I've been feeling my whole career. Like I've spent 30 years spraying X and I've always felt bad about it. Um, I think that, you know, it kind of touches, it's touched a nerve in a lot of these circles. I heard actually that, in one of these native plant Facebook groups that there was like this post where somebody posted a picture of my book and then it was like this huge fire, fire storm and the post was taken down and it was like this big deal. Um, you know, so it's, it's an ongoing conversation and I might add some kind of interesting sub <laughs> sub chapter about, that and what the the outcomes have been and if the conversations have shifted. I mean, I have talked to people at the USDA, um, you know, the California Invasive Species Council, uh, some, you know, more policy oriented um, folks at different agencies. And they, you know, one of the interesting things about it is that they are very much reliant on peer-reviewed research, and one of the things that I touched on a bit, and, you know, I, this might be something that I would update, but at the time that I was researching, there wasn't really a lot of non-herbicide-based management um, studies, like peer-reviewed research that had been done, and that's largely because the pesticide corporations are the ones that are funding these weed science um, degrees, and so, you know, rather than saying, like, how does rotational grazing compare to application of aminopyrolid on cheatgrass? They're saying, how much aminopyrolid do you put on an acre of cheatgrass? You know, like, that's their master's thesis. Um, and that's a problem. That's a big problem in academia in a number of different fields is that there's these big corporate interests that are you know, expecting certain outcomes having to do with sales of their products that are funding people's education. So they kind of set the, the framework. And um, that is unfortunate. And so I encourage people to kind of, if they're interested in this, um, you know, to really think about coming up, you know, pushing their departments or their uh, professors, whatever, to kind of come up with funding streams that are going to look at some of these alternative 
practices, which, you know, will take longer. It's oftentimes the experiments you're not going to necessarily know within like two months um, if something dies or not in, in, in terms of like what would happen if you spray it. Um, but you will have a lot richer body of knowledge um, about some of these alternative uh, practices. And so, um, you know, I'm, I think that there could be more of that. I've heard from several younger folks who have reached out to me and been like, I really want to study, you know, restoration ecology, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know what direction to go. And um, that's kind of what I tell them often is, you know, like, let's get some of this science on the ground where we're, we're looking at, at some of these alternatives, because that's where, you know, people at the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds great and all, but, you know, I can't just, like, write a policy memo about your random thought about goats or, you know, um, grazing systems versus herbicide. Like, they need to have the, the papers. So that, I, I would say, is... Um, you know, something to look forward to in the future that I'd like to report more on. <laughs> I'm in New Mexico right now on a, on a friend's piece of property and the mustard is really enthusiastic on uh -huh. some parts of the property, not all, just on some, right? And in the spring, when it was just the little rosettes, I was like, okay, great. I harvested a whole bunch of it and I made some pesto and put it in the freezer, you know, right? Uh -huh. And that's fine. But like, there's also a lot of it and it's in some areas that I want to do some other things with, right? So uh -huh. recently... I was, you know, just hand pulling some of it, you know, to clear the area. But as I was going through and pulling it up, I started to notice there was a lot of ladybugs on it. I'm like, oh, oh. hmm, the ladybugs seem to be on this plant more than anything else. So am oh, I wow. am I destroying ladybug habit, habitat right now, right? right. And so, yeah. you know. I started, and so then I looked at what I was doing, and I'm like, okay, well, let me limit the area that I'm going to clear, and let me be more careful as I'm doing it. Let me kind of shake the ladybugs off onto some nearby plants that, that are going to stay. You know, and I suppose some people maybe would say that ladybugs aren't native either, and so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting in that, I, you know, in situations like that, I kind of go to the question that I mentioned a bit earlier, like what what is your goal for the site and what makes the most sense to get you there? Like, could you use more organic matter? Would it make sense to, you know, chop it down and, and lay it down as mulch around perennials that you are planting and kind of plan on having that be like a, a longer term um, strategy for that area as the perennials grow, shade it out, it's not gonna be mustard anymore it's going to be you know the canopy of what you plan um but so there's many different uh you know potential avenues but yeah i think you know those observations are really important as well as you make your your plans like you know noticing the species that use it and you know thinking about making habitat for them elsewhere if you're planning on you know doing a big mowing or um removal project like they are serving an ecological function and so it's important to kind of um, plan for that elsewhere in your project as you mentioned you did with those ladybugs you know because um, they might you know the invasive species might be like in the middle of what you're wanting to to do something else with but you know just kind of acknowledging that they have a function and um seeing where else you might be able or how else you might be able to meet that function is important. Oh yeah, definitely. And and just in my mind too, there's just we hear all the stories about the the precipitous declines in insect populations and it's like, well, anything that's affecting insects badly at this point is something I want to avoid personally. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think that there and there's a lot of examples with invasives, you know, that are just havens for various insects like the um the spotted knapweed is one that's you know really common in the intermountain west montana idaho and um some of those more mountainous 
uh, states and you know it's a pollinator it, pollinators of all sorts native and non-native just love that plant and um but it, yet it's one of the most reviled plants in that region of, you know i think that there's some real uh tough conversations that need to be had in that context and it's largely because of ranching interests and people want grass and you know it's to me it's kind of a question of well can you create more mixed uh species pasture assemblages that would fulfill some of the needs of those pollinators and you know maybe napweed wouldn't become you know such a important food source for them as they have a more diverse offering that you're creating through your your range management right because our actions our actions have been changing the world and changing the ecosystems new plants have been coming into this and then in the meantime the native animals uh, and insects were there have just been making use of these new assemblages yeah i mean and we should be glad that they that they are because otherwise we would be in even more of a precarious situation. But, you know, as if you bend to these big agricultural producing areas, it's, there's very little habitat anywhere um, to be found. The, you know, the fields are sprayed right up to their fence lines and there's nothing but the crop. And so it's, it's no wonder to me that we're in that calamitous uh, situation with, the insect world. Um. Yeah, no, I'm from Nebraska. I'm quite familiar with that that landscape, you know, and 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 I've spent a lot of time in California too, and so I've seen the Central Valley and how it's just it's been completely raked over, you know. I mean, that is just one monocrop after one monocrop, and so then it's no surprise to find out that two thirds of the butterfly species in California now. Uh, use non-native plants for nectar sources and for laying their eggs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they've they've made use, made do with what is available, and you know, some of them haven't done as well. But you know, that's not the fault of the the species <laughs> that are at hand, in my opinion. That's the fault of the the design system that has taken away all their habitat. And, you know, I think just as an example in California, like the fact that almond growers have to import honeybees because they don't have any other forage except for those three weeks of the year that the almonds are flowering is, and they spend so much money to bring bees down from Oregon or elsewhere to pollinate these almonds. And you drive through there and it's like, there's so much potential. There's so many things that you could grow in that climate that would provide year-round nectar, and you wouldn't really reduce productivity, you know, per yield per acre that much just by interspersing a row of pollinator plants and or other crop species with more of a bloom period um, into those systems. I mean, it would be, you know, that's like low-hanging fruit, in my opinion, <laughs> literally. And... Um, it's just little, it's things like that where, you know, we start thinking about our relationship to the, the non-human world and what, uh, how we can position ourselves as real stewards of that and how we, we kind of need to, at this point, we need to be really thinking about integrating our livelihood um, in ways that serve them as well. And so that's something that I'm very keen on that sounds like a nice place to end it thanks so much for uh for your work on this issue thanks so much for writing a great book i'm glad to hear that you're um out talking to people about this still and that you're keeping this alive i think it's really important to be questioning this piece of what i consider to be pseudoscience yeah thank you it's it's always um interesting and fun discussions to be had, that's for sure. <laughs> Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, 
with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.